My name is Valerie Bassett. Uh, I live in Westport and I'm also the Executive Director of the Women's Fund of Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, I've been married to my wife for almost 13 years and my LGBTQ watershed moment has to do with marriage. In 2003, I was working for the Boston Health Department and one afternoon in the fall, a colleague of mine who was a gay man, who was an attorney, came running down the hall and said, the Mass Supreme Court decision is out. We won, you've got to read it. And I couldn't even fully process uh, what he was saying, but I did immediately drop what I was doing and go read uh, the decision. And I, it hit me in a way that I had never even anticipated. Um, I'm gonna read a beautiful paragraph from it that got to the core for me. Um, this is from November, 2003. Massachusetts Constitution affirms the dignity and equality of all individuals. It forbids the creation of second-class citizens. In reaching our conclusion, we've given full deference to the arguments made by the Commonwealth, but it has failed to identify any constitutionally adequate reason for denying civil marriage to same-sex couples. When I read the affirming of the dignity and quality of all individuals and the forbidding of the creation of second-class citizens, I realized in some part of me I had been holding on to a sense of myself as a second-class citizen, even though I didn't even know I was, and that that was in some way healed by this decision, uh, which was a very powerful historical moment for me. My name is Cynthia Cummings and I am Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, I've been involved in LGBT activism since I was a college student back in the 1970s and um, part of my job now is working with students about issues of oppression and ostracism and helping to establish a more inclusive campus community. This afternoon, I'm gonna be talking at our first annual LGBT Lavender graduation ceremony. And um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, I started thinking a little bit about symbols and symbols that have meant something because we have a rainbow flag that flies on our campus. And I was thinking that before the rainbow flag, um, the LGBT community identified strongly with the symbol of the pink triangle, which um, was one of the stamps, I believe they called it, of shame that were used in the Nazi concentration camps, um, such as the yellow star was used for Jews, the pink triangle was used to identify particularly male homosexuals um, during that period. And in the 70s, when I was in college, um, LGBT activists took the pink triangle to symbolize our resistance to homophobic systems and actions. And we began to wear the small pink triangle as a symbol of our pride in who we were and to express our identities to each other. Um, it was kind of a symbol of being a member of a secret society because most straight people had no idea what it meant. Um, and as time has continued, um, that symbol has kind of faded into the background as the rainbow flag has taken prominence. Um, I'm going to talk to my students this afternoon a little bit about um, their ability to wave that flag and wave it proudly and to be out in the open and to declare their identities, um, as opposed to a time when um, LGBT people were isolated, ostracized, stamped with symbols that were denigrating. Um, and I want to take pleasure in their successes and their achievements um, that are really rooted in their courage, their strength, and their resilience. Hi, my name is Dennis Wong. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of this project uh, celebrating Stonewall's 50th anniversary. Um, a milestone for me was this incredibly huge festival in Thompson Square Park in the Lower East Side. It was organized by uh, this 
a very well-known drag queen named Lady Bunny. And it was her and a few other people. And they just figured in celebrating the end of Labor Day, let's have a big festival of music, art. And there actually was a movie made of it in the uh, early 90s. Um, well, it was my time, it was 1989 when I went. And there was a lot of stuff going on in my life, um, coming out, uh, getting to know who I was, and being at this big festival. And it was the most amazing learning experience of my life. Uh, being there, listening to Lady Bunny, RuPaul, who was still just a little old, like, <laughs> little old lady out in the Lower East Side, who now is incredibly famous. Um, just talking about the LGBTQ community, what we are, who we are, what we stand for, and um, how we really need to take care of one another and be on the lookout for each other. And at this time, for me personally, in the late 80s in New York, it was the AIDS crisis. So that really added a lot of comfort to me personally. But just being in a, in a, in a big open forum like this, and it was a concert, a festival, uh, it really helped me and a lot of other people understand um, we as a community need to stand together and we need to celebrate. We also need to be careful and, and watch our backs and stick together on a united front. But uh, overall, um, it's, it's a big milestone uh, in my life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Edmonton, and I am a historian, artist, and born and raised New Bedfordite. So honestly, this is fairly recent, so I'm not sure if it really counts as a possible big milestone. Uh, for a lot of people it was. It was probably the yes on three vote that recently happened. Um, it was, for folks who may not remember, it was about removing transgender projections from public facilities like bathrooms. And I remember helping canvas for it and helping make sure, knock on everyone's door to be aware of what a Yes on 3 was, especially on UMass Dartmouth campus. And I remember a really pivotal moment where I thought that maybe things would be okay was when I was actually just at work doing my normal stuff and a woman obviously received a call from a canvasser saying, you know, um, essentially the, the normal questions canvassers are asked, which is, you know, are you considering to vote yes on three or no on three? Um, do you know about the protections involved? And I could hear her positively answering, you know, absolutely, I am voting yes on three. I think it makes no sense that people are being discriminated against in the bathrooms. And I remember just feeling like, so, so much light in my heart and feeling that this would be okay but I did go to bed nervous and um, waited until morning when a co-worker of mine texted me and said uh, everything's okay <laughs> and I had to check the news the next day to make sure that it was actually everything was okay and that everyone a good majority of Massachusetts voted yes on three my name is Jane Yaretsky, and I am the curator of New Bedford Art Museum Artworks. Um, an important milestone for me in queer culture um, was actually um, seeing the L word, and I know that that might be a little bit stereotypical, but uh, the L word came out in the uh, 90s, early aughts, and I didn't see it until later into the 2000s. Um, and the thing that really uh, was important for me was the opening sequence when they're showing Catherine Opie's prints. Um, Catherine, Catherine Opie has been a, a major uh, important artist, queer artist, um, that has influenced me in so many ways, including helping me come out. So Catherine Opie, late 90s photography. <laughs> My milestone. My name is John Baskin Sellows, and I'm the president of the Community Foundation of Southeastern Massachusetts based here in New Bedford. I'm also a New Bedford native, uh, but after, out of college I actually moved to New York City the first half of my career, which was in banking, and then I moved out to San Francisco in the mid-80s uh, to continue my banking career, and really then in 1986 was when I came out as a gay man. Uh, and if you think back to the 1980s, AIDS and HIV were an overwhelming presence uh, in the gay community. And the reality of that life for me at that period of time greatly informs who I am to this day and has motivated me in a variety of ways. When I think about a specific milestone, 
There were many, but one in particular that comes to me is the AIDS Memorial Quilt uh, in October of 1992. It was laid out for one of the last times in its entirety because it became too enormous uh, to fit into one place uh, in October of 1992. And I went with a large contingent of San Franciscans. Uh, Cleve Jones was the San Franciscan behind the idea. Uh, and to just give you a little sense of what the AIDS Memorial quilt is, they are quilts basically the size of a grave that are handcrafted generally in memory of somebody or in memory of a group of folks. And by this time in 1992, uh, it covered about 15 acres. There were probably about 40,000 panels. I participated in making many panels for friends of mine who died. Uh, so being there at that time, October 1992, we were finally saying goodbye to the horrendous lack of leadership from the Reagan and the Bush administration around HIV and AIDS. And we were welcoming, uh, we would be electing Bill Clinton that next month, uh, which was an incredible sign of hope and what was a very, very dark period for many of us. Uh, that moment was a great coming together. It was between the cathartic, there were the protest marches. It was incredibly joyful and celebratory, but it was also heartbreaking to stand there on the mall and have th tens of thousands of names read of folks who had died of HIV and AIDS. And to be, think about that in your 20s and 30s and spending way too much of your time in hospitals, at funerals, at protest marches, because whole segments there are names that resound for me 30 plus years later of friends who I had to bury in my 20s and 30s, which is just inconceivable and should not be the case. But what that has done for me is it has given me direction in my life and passion and purpose that my work has got to be around bettering society from the philanthropic work I do to protecting uh, underserved populations to celebrating human diversity and making sure that our public health is the best it can absolutely be. Uh, because again, no one should ever have to go through that plague that we all suffered and are still suffering uh, to a certain extent. So it's, uh, it looms large for me. Uh, just last week, I was reminded of one of my dearest friends who died 25 years ago uh, because of AIDS. Uh, and it really reminds you of the urgency, the desire to take care of your own community when many are more than happy to not bother with you, as many Americans did. But the gay community in San Francisco in particular and a lot of our straight allies realized we've got to take care of ourselves and it's exactly what we did. And that memorial quilt to this day is such a powerful memory for me of the craft of it, the personality, the fact that each individual makes up a whole. There's a beauty and a resonance and a constancy to that that will never be forgotten for those of us who lived through those particularly horrific years uh, of the epidemic. I'm Mandy Grace and I'm a native of New Bedford. In 2010, I still remember when every woman in my family was heartbroken because Ricky Martin came out as gay. And he wasn't just apologetic or exploratory gay, he came out as a fortunate homosexual man who considered himself blessed. And when you think of the role of social media today and how coming out has become its own act of resistance, you think of how this man so powerful in the Latino, Latina, Latinx community still was so afraid of sharing something that was so much a part of his life. In the same year, we also see Dan Savage release the It Gets Better project, and it was in response to a wave of teenage suicide with queer youth or youth that were accused of being queer and they release hundreds of videos basically assuring youth that it gets better, we're here, and we've always been here. My name is Bev Pacelli, and I'm a lifelong resident of Greater New Bedford, and I am also a director of Southeastern Adoption Services. More than 25 years ago, we were the first agency in Massachusetts who helped gay and lesbian couples and single people adopt children, both domestically and here in the United States. 
and that is uh, probably the proudest part of my 37 year career as a social worker. Um, prior to that time, it was impossible for gay men or lesbians to become parents. Um, it was difficult for them to reconcile their sexuality with the idea that they had to give up parenthood for the rest of their lives. So we were able to find ways and agencies that would work with our clients. And I'm proud to say that I've been in touch with more than a hundred of our clients over the years and um, all the adoptions are working out really well and all the families are parenting just as if they were heterosexual parents. Thanks to the fact that uh, there's more acceptance and celebration of gay families in this state as well as this country than there was a quarter of a century ago.